Hi, I'm Michael Killen, host of the Killen Report. Today I am in the CMC studios in Marin TV, and my guest is a hero of mine, a man I've admired his work for many, many years. He is Spencer Michaels, and I used to thoroughly enjoy watching the Neil Lair show and its follow-on show, and watching the various news pieces he's provided. So he's Spencer Michaels, a former PBS long-term correspondent. Nice to see you, Michael. Did I uh, introduce you effectively? Oh, yeah, uh, that's, that's right. They closed down our bureau a couple of years ago in San Francisco, and so I was old enough I could retire, yeah. but uh, the PBS NewsHour no longer has any bureaus anywhere in the United States except for Paul Salmon out of Boston, who does financial reporting. Yeah, and if I understand it correctly, he gets funding from uh, the foundation that came out of General Motors. Sloan Foundation. Sloan Foundation. Right. He has his own funding, and that keeps him going. But the News Hour, like every place else, has had a tough time financially, and uh, they had to cut back. Yeah, I guess that's too bad. Yeah, it is too bad. I mean, there aren't very many organizations like that that do in-depth news. Uh, and, and the News Hour was providing a service that, that a lot of people liked, uh, not just the quick. When I, when I watch CBS, NBC, ABC today, I'm always amazed how superficial they are. I, th I think they're honest. I think they do a good job. They're innovative. But, you know, as Walter Cronkite said, the entire CBS News Hour could f fit into the front page of the New York Times. It's, it's very short compared to the amount of news there is. And so uh, a newscast like NBC or CBS has got to be somewhat superficial. So the shows are superficial today. They're honest, uh, most, well, I like to think most of them are, but the topics today, and I guess at any period in, in history, are complex, very complex. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, I would agree. And I think that's where the news hour had a, and still does have, a, an advantage. You take, I don't know, you talk about climate change, one of your favorite subjects. That's a tough subject. You can't do it in a minute and a half on a newscast. They used to have a rule when I started in television that sound bites, a person talking within a story, should probably be no more than 30, 40 seconds long. Today, listen to the sound bites on NBC and CBS. Eight seconds is about maximum, sometimes four seconds. A person gets to say half a sentence, and then they're on to something else. It, you can't get the depth of what you want, or what I want anyway, in, in that kind of a situation. Yes. When you were making news pieces, how many minutes was a particular one? Well, it depends when you're talking about. When I first started, which is a long time ago, I was working in a television station in Sacramento. We could do a two and a half minute story. That was commercial television. You very rarely see a two and a half minute story on commercial television today. Uh, they, the shorter, the better the more what they call story count is what they're after. As many stories as you can squeeze into that half hour, uh, it'll keep the audience interested. If you go 45 seconds or a minute or a minute and a half on a story, yeah. oh, that'd be terrible. I used to be able to do two and a half minute stories. It got shorter over the years. They wanted it shortened. And one of the reasons I, I left commercial television, went to public television, went to work at KQED in San Francisco, was that you could go longer. You could explain things. And that, that was what was interesting. Yeah. Paul Simon's shows on PBS, how long are they right now? Paul Solomon? Solomon, yes. Well, he does stories that'll yeah. run uh, six, seven, eight, nine minutes, well, which is what I was doing. Yeah, he has. Yeah, we, that that's, was the beauty of being able to work for the News Hour. You could take a complicated subject and explore it for seven or eight or nine minutes. And that's a long time. 
Even the news hour wanted them cut back a little bit. Uh, don't make them quite so long. Six minutes is enough, but we can cheat and we can get it up to seven and a half. Uh, it's always been an issue in television and it always will be. There's this great divide between how much will an audience accept and how much do you want to feed them? How much do you want to give them? It, it takes 10 minutes to explain. Uh, I did a story on cloud computing when it first started. I did the first television major story on cloud computing. It's a tough subject to explain. You can't do that in a minute or a minute and a half. Yeah. Uh, it needed eight or nine minutes to, to explain what it was. And uh, that was the beauty. And some people would say even that's too short. Now, whether anybody's going to sit through an eight or nine minute story, especially in today's world, when everybody's got a headset on and they're looking at their iPad or their, their iPhone and they don't want to see anything longer than, a, than 10 seconds, that's all the time they've got. For us to feed them, Paul Salmon or me or anybody, a 10 minute story or an eight minute story is an act of faith because who's going to sit there for eight minutes and watch a complicated explanation of cloud computing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So our environment has changed with the internet, with cell phones, and I don't know, is something else that's changing our environment that makes it difficult for people to sit in front of the television? Well, modern life, I think, in general, is much faster and people are busier. Um, when television started, it was new and people would sit down. But I, I hardly know anybody who sits down and watches a whole newscast anymore. I also don't know very many people who take a newspaper. Uh, I, my, I have a son who lives in San Francisco in a 12-unit apartment house. Not one of the tenants in that apartment house takes a newspaper. It, the, the world has changed. I yeah. mean, new, and obviously the newspapers are suffering because of it, and the television networks are suffering because of it, and, and it's, it's a different ballgame. And besides uh, people wanting uh, less information, or little sound bites almost, uh, what about the quality of the news we're getting? Well, I think. What everybody says, and I'm sure you hear this as well, especially from younger people, I get all my news from the internet. I, I, I read everything on the internet. You can read all sorts of stuff on the internet, and, um, the, and the quality varies, obviously. If you go on some crazy site, and uh, you know, white supremacist site or something, <laughs> you're going to get terrible quality, yeah. obviously. But you can go on and Google some subject you're interested in or a news subject and you can read forever on it yes. and you can get it pretty fast. The news gathering is, is, is somewhat easier than it used to be because it's all there in front of you. Just imagine 25 years ago, you're doing a, a story and you need to know, I'm, I want to know how many prisoners there are in the California prison system. Like, I mean today like that, you just yeah. put, knock it into Google. And 20 years ago, yeah, you call the information officer at the California Corrections Department, and she wouldn't be there, and you'd have to call back, and, and maybe you'd get the information. Today, they've got kids working in these newsrooms are checking every fact, so there's, it's more accurate. It can be more accurate. It can be more in-depth if they allow for the in-depth, but that's, that's the problem. And I guess you can't make people want to read or watch in-depth programs, you have to entice them somehow or another. And, and some people want to do that. I mean, I read three newspapers a day and I'm not even working anymore. But yeah. most people don't. What newspapers are you reading today? The New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco something? I'm reading three real newspapers, paper papers, yeah. uh, not counting online. I'm reading the New York Times delivered to my house, the San Francisco Chronicle delivered to my house, and the Marin County Independent Journal delivered to my house. Plus, I'll look at stuff online as well. But, I mean, that's me, and that's, I'm getting older. You know, younger people aren't doing that. As I said, nobody in this apartment building I was talking about takes a single newspaper. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, let's see, uh, the news hour, okay? And, and we both agree 
it's hard to get people to sit and watch the TV shows. And some people say the internet has had an adverse impact of that. And you know, some could say, well, it took the eyeballs over there, uh, but it's speeded up things. But I can get the news, uh, uh, the nightly news on the internet. If uh, I don't have to use the medium of TV, but still, the kids don't want to go maybe and watch the kind of information that the nightly business news is giving us. Well, the well. nightly regular news, yeah. Um, that's true, and no one knows what to do about it. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that New York Times just had a, a oh, big later. discussion of how they're going to change the New York Times because their, their circulation is down and their revenues are down. There aren't any more classified ads in newspapers, which is a mainstay of newspapers. Well, if you, that's true. Yeah, yeah. If they're gone. Why would you put a classified ad in the newspaper when you can go on Craig's, Craigslist? You yeah. know, and do it for free. So the newspaper's revenue stream is down, and they're having a hell of a time. And, and so they're plunging into this digital world yeah. in a way that they aren't sure what they're doing. Yeah. And, and it's, it's sort of interesting to watch them. They're trying to develop revenue streams from their digital uh, offerings, and some of them are making it and some of them are not. Yeah, I can see every nightly news show, uh, they always say, well, to get more information on this, the rest of my interview with so-and-so go on to PBS website. And I can see how the New York Times is speeding up the delivery of news. You know, they release their news story the night before. That's right. And and, and But that also feeds the uh, television news people because they are already working that story and when I pick up my newspaper in the morning, I- It's old. <laughs> You've yeah. already heard it all. Yeah. That's right. And it, it's, it's kind of scary to see how that works. Uh, this last few weeks, the, the New York Times, the Washington Post have been doing this, this stuff with, with Trump and the Russians. <laughs> and they'll have a, New York Times had a, this website that they figured out somehow or another what was going on. And with, within 10 minutes, you know, MSNBC, CNN, the radio, everybody was talking about it. it it's a whole new world. Yeah. Whether it's in depth or not, uh, sort of depends on the viewer. I think the in-depth is there to get if you want to put the time into it. I don't think most people want to put the time into it. Yeah, and you said we don't know how things are going to shake out or how to, let's see, beef up programs like the nightly business re new, uh, the new PBS uh, News Hour. Yes, and, and give more in-depth and we don't know how help the newspapers or how, what the newspapers are going to be doing, except moving more and more everything onto the internet, I guess. Well, everything, but the internet has such a vast array of information that if you go search for it, if you want to spend the time, I mean, I could take out my iPhone and sit here for the next 20 minutes and read one or two stories that are in-depth on that machine. And, and they're good stories. Uh, Associated Press uh, yeah. has a website free that you can look at the stories as they get to the newspapers. Um, there's there's a lot there if you if you want to go after it. A lot of people don't want to go after it. They're yeah. they're too busy. You know, you always hear this, the thing. Well, I've got I get home from work. I'm tired. My kids are there. I got to play with the kids. I got to help my wife with dinner. Yeah. Blah 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 blah. Or the wife is busy. Uh, she's at work too. They don't have time for yeah. uh, th two hours with the newspaper. Good. A moment ago, you mentioned you did a piece on cloud computing, okay? Yeah, and that was a while ago. Don't ask me too I'm much gonna, about it. I'm not going to ask you anything. But when you look back, what was the most interesting and or important piece, the one you really liked the most that you contributed to society? What comes to mind? I don't know. I, that's a, always a hard question, and people wonder, what's the most interesting story, the most important story you ever did? And, and I, I don't really have a good answer for that. I know what the stories that I remember are. Um, I, I covered the assassination of, of Robert Kennedy. 
Um, I covered, to some extent, the, the downfall of Richard Nixon in various ways. Um, I walked through Disneyland with Richard Nixon once. Um, it's sort of interesting. My, the beginning of my career, so long ago, I've covered John Kennedy at, at UC Berkeley. I mean, being close to famous, important people has always been interesting, I think, to most, to most people. That's one of the reasons you go into journalism. You sort of want to want to be part of it. You, don't want, you, you want to be a good observer of it. And those are some of the things that have uh, stood out as far as I'm concerned. So if you want to go into journalism, you want to be part of it. So you have wanted to be part of the action. But not, not part of the action in terms of determining it. And, and the one thing I want to stress is, I'm not trying to, to tell the country how to think. I'm trying to find out what's going on and then and let them it. think. And, sure. and this idea of, of advocacy, advocacy journalism has never been part of what I've been involved with. Sure, I have my own political opinions, but I really keep them out of anything I do. And I think most journalists that I know have that opinion. I don't think they do it. Fox News, maybe. And I don't know, MSNBC, maybe, I don't know. I, I sort of like MSNBC, but I, I think that a good journalist would, would be just as mean to Hillary Clinton as she would be to Donald Trump. And uh, no matter what the political opinion is or how they vote, you're going to do an investigative piece on Hillary or on Donald Trump, it's the same thing. You go after the facts and you try to find out what really happened and you put it out there for people to see. And you don't distort it because, you know, the head of your company happens to be a right-wing zealot or whatever he is. You have seen one show I produced where I was a talk show. And it was today. And uh, you sh did you see me show my colors? Did you see me take a position, try to alter? Well, I think you've sort of laid out where you're coming from, and uh, I think that it's sort of obvious. Yeah, uh, but I think that's okay in a show like this. This is, this is not a news show. We're talking about hard news when you report the news for millions of people to watch, um, and, and you call it news. This is more of an interview, discussion, in depth, and you can have an opinion. That's why people might watch it. Uh, I mean, I'll watch Rachel Maddow. I know she's biased, mm -hmm. but, but she's interesting. And I'll, I'll evaluate her. And uh, I might watch Bill O'Reilly uh, less, but I, I might. <laughs> OK. So I would like to mention a couple of developments uh, that are occurring. And, and I want to ask you if if you were near one of these developments, would you want to report on it? How about the California governor, Jerry Brown's efforts to be, make California and its partners, different states, a different country, uh, America's leader in addressing climate change? Would you want to? Absolutely. In fact, I've, think, I've been thinking of it as a, as a story sure it's it's an obvious california story that would appeal to the rest of the nation though they get a little tired in the rest of the nation of hearing how great we are in california yeah. but sure get, jerry brown is the is the anti trump yes you know? and what about his plan for september of 2018 to have this big conference on climate change energy in san francisco even right now would you in a month or two, one to help put that uh, report on the plan, the scope, who might be there, how it might be structured. Would you want to do a? St um, sounds a little boring. A little boring. <laughs> well, you know, plans and who's going to come. I, yes. I, I guess from my training, I, I've always sort of, sort of been in, told, and we want to interview Joe Blow. We can get him. We don't need him at a conference in San Francisco. Yeah. We don't need him at a conference in Davos. We can get him on our air when we think it is. Now, if the conference is like the Paris Accords yeah. on, on climate change, then you've got another situation. Yeah. 
But just because Jerry Brown is going to bring together some experts doesn't mean it's it's all that newsworthy. Well, but what if what if there's going to be some promise, some major impact that might occur, a geopolitical? Uh, I mean, that could be the zenith of his anti-Trump position on climate change. That, what about if it was that? It gets it gets sort of sexy after a while. Yeah, sure, that becomes very interesting. If you can make it interesting, what you don't love are twelve guys sitting in a row all talking about their own feelings on this subject. That gets boring. And uh, but the but the result of it, the Paris Accords or the San Francisco Accords, if they're going to be any such thing, sure, that's a big. Big story. What's scary again then, though, getting back to what we talked about earlier, is how do you put that in an in-depth kind of a way, as opposed to you know one sentence, two sentences, and it's and it's over. Uh, you want to background it. You want to you want to have some knowledge of what it's about. I mean, everybody in the world doesn't know um, what carbon credits are and those kind of things. You have to sort of explain those and that's where you where you, skill in doing presenting the news yeah. is what's important and in that skill is there one thought or idea you could share with myself and the audience on how you go about making a good piece of news story well i i think this, this is an oversimplification but I, I used to think when I was doing news stories, how am I going to explain this to my grandparents or to my oh, parents? Yeah. I, I've got to make cloud computing, as the example we've been using, understandable to people who never heard of it before. And, mm -hmm. and um, how do you do that? I think that's the key. Now, do you have time to do that on a 22-minute newscast at the end of the day for NBC? No, you don't. Uh, so it becomes more difficult. So they they go for the for what the controversy is. But from my point of view, to take a story like this and background it and explain it so that almost anybody could understand it, is the is the challenge and the fun of what I've been doing for my career. Okay. So grandpa and grandma are in your mind when you're trying to put one of these together. Yeah, except now I'm the grandpa. <laughs> but, but that's an exciting time of life. And how many grandchildren do you have? Three. Three. And how old? One's 18, one's 15, and one's 11. Oh, well, 11 is the most interesting to you? <laughs> no. No, they're, they're all, all interesting. They're all interesting. What am I, I'm not going to go out and say which one my grandchildren. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't, because I couldn't do that. I'd get in no, trouble. You certainly would. Okay. Now, so I threw out some ideas as to project that I that you might be interested in. What are a couple, and if you ask me this question, I might not be able to pull them out of my hat right now, that you would be interested in working on? Well, I, I think I've always done stories on California water, and Jerry Brown's idea to put tunnels under the uh, delta the, the and, and the, uh, well, the, the tunnels. Yeah. Um, and it's it's uh, the peripheral canal all over again, but it's a fascinating subject. California's water is something I'm always inc I love driving up and down the state and looking at the water oh, yeah. uh, because it's just it's made this state what it is. This is the most productive state in the, in the world, yeah. and uh, so that's interesting. And then if you tie it in with Jerry Brown and his so-called legacy which he denies he's interested in. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's one subject, I think. The, the climate change thing that you bring up, of course, and Jerry Brown's leadership, I think there's some leadership there, um, is worth exploring. That, in yeah. fact, that's a good question. Is Jerry Brown really leading uh, anything at all here? I, is it gonna make a difference? That would be a wonderful topic. Uh, of course, climate is, change is, is not just a California issue. But I, I tend to think it is a value that he is the leader, and it, it's California, because we have a lot of panache or cachet and respect around the world. Where California wants to go, a lot of people think 
God, that's probably a good idea. And I know there's a lot of people who don't. Okay. Well, there's a big article about Texas in the New Yorker this week. And uh, the worst thing you could call somebody in Texas is a Californian. <laughs> I mean, they think California is crazy, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and maybe we are. I, I don't know, but there's, there's a lot of dissension about that. Okay. Uh, but there are a lot of subjects that make California fascinating. I mean, Silicon Valley is just such an amazing place. Yeah. And, and almost anything you do there is, is interesting. Uh, New York Times had a piece the other day on, on the, the design of the buildings in Silicon Valley and why they're not very good. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on that, that is interesting. Yeah. And I watched a video of a woman who interviewed you at some time in the past and she asked you what are the, the qualities to, that make a good news reporter. And I can remember one, maybe you what, what's the quality that makes a good news? Well, report? curiosity, of course. Yeah, that's what I heard. And uh, I think accuracy and a demand for accuracy. And then skill. You, you've got to have some skill in, in shaping what you do. Yeah. And there are different kinds of news reporters. You know, getting the scoop on the Russians is one thing. Explaining the California water project and the tunnels under the delta is something else that it requires different skills, but but basically a desire to explain to your grandmother or whoever how it works. Why does it work this way? What are the conflicts? When doesn't it work? Uh, it's it's an interesting business. You sort of can, you know, get up in the air and look down and, and see what's yes. going on. Yeah. And what about bringing order to a topic and to your own mind about it? No. Well, if there's order to be had, I don't, I don't think you have to presuppose that there is order. Um, I mean, I, I try not to have a preconceived notion when I go into a story that we have to find the order here. Maybe there isn't any order. Maybe it's all so, random. That, <laughs> you know? That's a good point. I, there are some topics I'm thinking about as an artist. Okay, you know, you know right. I make paintings, and I can't see the order, and I'm not ready to undertake them because maybe there is no order there. But we are running out of time and I want to make just a couple announcements. Uh, this painting is by Harry Cohen and I know you know him. It's really cool. Uh, it, yeah, and he's a master artist and I want to thank him for making the art available and when he makes art and when I make art, part of it is to make order bring order of something to our mind. And then I want to say this. Um, my guest has been Spencer Michaels, a long-term PBS news correspondent, and I have thoroughly enjoyed my 20-something minutes with him, and I want to thank you very much. Thank you. A lot of fun. Okay.